really asking yourself these questions to stay engaged is, I, I believe, what, what's going to make you do well in the cars? Armin back with another MCAT podcast. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you, Ryan? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm excited to, to jump in, continue with our breakdown of Blueprint Prep, Full Length One, Car Section, Passage Nine. We're, we're getting there. It's incredible doing these kind of week by week, each, each passage, each set of discretes for the science sections. It's like, I... I like it takes months and months and months to go over all these. <laughs> You're doing all this in like seven hours on MCAT test day. I'm like, it just yeah. blows my mind how much is being tested in one day. I, I agree, and and thank you for doing this. I mean, I know this is doing such a service to many pre med students. You know, going through this, the MCAT is such a difficult exam, and specifically going to Blueprint One and having somebody there to to guide you along with it. That's I think this is a valuable, very valuable resource for pre medical students. Yeah, I I love free free MCAT prep for everyone. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, as always, if you want to follow along, if you're listening to this, we are recording the video so you can go watch us read these questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, wherever you're watching, listening, you can get this full length for free from Blueprint Prep at blueprintprep.com. And uh, you get a half length diagnostic, you get the full length one, all for free. You get a bunch of other stuff too, like your uh, prep calendar creator tool and, and lots of other fun goodies. So with that said, uh, what, are we, what are we doing today? What's in store for our passage today? Yeah, so this passage is very good. It's it's a very interesting passage, and it's something very personal to me. Uh, you may read this and be like, "What?" But I recently found a lot of interest in the Arctic, and um, I recently returned from a trip to the Arctic. How about like you know, I went to the the edge of the Arctic and recently to Alaska, and I'm just in love <laughs> with the Arctic. Really? So how yeah, does I, how does one get interested in the Arctic? <laughs> <laughs> have you i i have never known how much i've missed out on life until i've come back and i have a favorite glacier nice like <laughs> <laughs> like a favorite have you ever had a favorite glacier before i've only been to one I, i've been to anchorage once and, and went to a glacier uh on a little day trip uh um, nice. and it's it's definitely powerful like just Nature and, and those parts of the untouched world are just so powerful. Yeah, agreed. It's inspiring. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's very, very powerful. So going through this passage, I have to stop myself from getting my opinions into it. But I'm very engaged in this passage because, um, you know, I've, I've become very uh, in love with the Arctic. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to hear that passion come out with this passage. So let's go and jump in. Sounds good. So, until climate change thinned the ice, the North Bus Passage existed as a cautionary tale among navigators rather than a predictable trade route. Henry Hudson was marooned by his own crew while trying to make the journey. In 1845, a British expedition led by Sir John Franklin attempted to navigate the strait northwest of Labrador, the last uncharted stretch of the passage. His two Steam-powered crafts, while heavily reinforced and well-provisioned, uh, became icebound in the Victoria Strait, and his entire crew of 129 perished. So this is a definitely a very interesting uh, paragraph. It gives us a lot of insight that you know we're going to be talking specifically about the Northwest Passage, and and the author mentions that until climate change thinned the ice, this was pretty unknown and adventurous and kind of like this dark gray area that people had to go, uh, you know, it wasn't like going to Hawaii. It was much, much more in depth than that. And, and gives an example specifically, uh, Sir John Franklin, um, that, that was right, you know, he was right. He had his two team powered crafts, heavily reinforced and well provisioned. And despite that, they became icebound and the entire crew perished. Yep. So what would you highlight in this paragraph? Uh, I would probably highlight the climate change, uh, obviously being a big factor of, of what is going on here and, and the change of, of this Northwest Passage being something that 
was very bad and then potentially with climate change making it a little bit easier to to travel and then the this last part i don't know if i would highlight these because these are just examples showing you that it's a cautionary tale among navigators agreed agreed yeah it's 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 a cautionary tale pre climate change and here's an example of sir john franklin who was ready but perished yeah right all right So scientists have since located the two shipwrecks and recovered artifacts and human remains on King William Island. Forensic investigations have revealed pneumonia to be the leading cause of death, but recovered bones show evidence of scurvy and cannibalism. Furthermore, the crew were suffering from acute lead poisoning, ooh, previous week, (laughs) from the solder used to seal the ration cans. So in here, the author is mentioning they, you know, died of pneumonia, but there were a lot of other problems too. Specifically, um, you know, they're the soldering use, the scurvy, and cannibalism. Interesting. Yeah. So this one, I think, um, uh, obviously, they've recovered them, and that's interesting. And then pneumonia is a leading cause of death, and um, some examples of some other things. That, yeah. that they were afflicted with. Agreed. Agreed. Now we go on to the third paragraph. Ultimately, whew, deep words, right? The true cause of death. Whew, interesting. <laughs> Hone in here. Was a failure to adopt suitable Arctic survival strategies. Interesting. Local Inuit uh, encountered Franklin's crew on a number of occasions. Interactions recorded decades later offered definitive evidence uh, as the final fate of the expedition. Definitive evidence. Definitive. Interviews revealed the Inuit were willing to help, but efforts at meaningful communication were fruitless. As far as the Inuit could infer, instead of securing shelter and food, the British attempted to travel south to mainland Canada, an impossible feat without transportation. So they were up here in the Northwest Passage. They ran into the Inuits. The Inuits attempted to help, but the British would not you know, have it. They wanted to go down south of Canada, and it was the author believes it was impossible without transportation. Uh, without transportation. They were... Caught in clothing, ill-suited for the climate, hunted sparse game birds while ignoring the herds of caribou on the island and the seals out on the ice. Strangers cooked their meat, Ooh, sapping it of vital nutrients. That's pretty interesting. Inuit avoided scurvy by consuming the law rivers uh, and skins of sea animals. Without this practice, they would never have survived for a thousand years on a diet lacking any fruit, fresh fruit. Mm. So in here what would you say is pretty important it's really just the failure to adapt to me is yeah. is uh the biggest thing uh lots of examples of the adaptation uh obviously wearing the right clothing eating the right food in in that specific landscape and environment yep agreed agreed the failure to adapt is what led to their demise yep. Inuit technology is also superbly adapted to to the Arctic. Igloo making provides comparative warmth and shelter during nights that can drop well below zero. Okay. The thick furred huskies the Inuit use for sled dogs possess strength and endurance. Combining sled dogs with harpoons allows the Inuit to reach the air holes in the ice used by seals and harvest these calorie-rich animals. While Franklin's men could never have mastered the Arctic, uh, Adopting elements of the Inuit lifestyle could have prolonged survival to be rescued. So the author in here is really talking about Inuit technology. And does the author believe that Franklin could have lived there indefinitely? No. No, not long all, right? enough for survival. Yep. To be could have lived there long enough for survival if they would have adapted. And that yeah. kind of fits into the main idea that you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. The conquest of an art and of Antarctica put Inuit ways to the ultimate test. Less than decade, less than decade after the first humans set foot on the continent, in 1911, the expeditions of Norwegian Roald Amundsen and British explorer Robert Falcon Scott raced across the southernmost continent in an attempt to be the first to reach the South Pole. Okay, so we have this race: Norwegian Amundsen and British explorer uh, Scott. They're racing to go down to the South Pole. Five years earlier, 
Amut Dessen had actually completed the first successful tra uh, traversal of the North Bus Passage by a European. So going back up to the Arctic, uh, Amut Dessen did so, and a journey which he learned a great deal about Arctic survival from the Natsilik Inuit. So learning from them, he was able to navigate the North Bus Passage, and now he's down here in Antarctica. In preparation for a South Pole try, Amundesen used these lessons. While he planned to do a great deal of his travels on skis, he also acquired 100 Greenland sled dogs to haul provisions and constructed clothing and footwear for his crew, primarily from furs and skins. So what, what can you take away from this paragraph? Uh, so it's it's funny. This is one of those passages that, that I love, I think, because there's not a lot for me to remember. This is just an example. Previously, we've been given examples of failure to adapt. And this is an example of someone who didn't fail to adapt, who, who actually adapted a lot of these Inuit, quote unquote, technologies and ways of living that led them to be successful. Bingo. Yeah. So what, you know, what can you highlight in here? That pretty much says that. Um, so this uh, he learned a great deal about Arctic survival from the Inuit. Perfect. Uh, I like that. I like that. And uh, he really tried in preparation for a South Pole try, right? He mm. used these lessons. Now in the last paragraph, unfortunately, the Scott expedition chose to use ponies, motorized vehicles, and human muscle power to haul the equipment sledges on the final dash across the Arctic, uh, Antarctic plateau. Worse, Scott's expedition wore wool and cotton clothing, Ooh, rings a bell, uh, which, which absorbed moisture and failed to repel the winds. The Norwegian team practically glided to the South Pole and back without incident. Scott and his men, meanwhile, arrived five weeks later and died on the return trip, overcome by fatigue, malnutrition, and exposure. So why do you think the author wrote this? What was the author's main point? It's to compare and contrast adaptation versus not yeah uh, compare and contrast adaptation versus not and make the point that adaptation is is important yeah specifically in these arctic conditions adapt or die <laughs> literally <laughs> yep 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 so let's uh go ahead to the questions um question number 48 so which of the following does the author suggest about the Northwest Passage? So the author suggests a million things, right? So we have to go into the answer choices. So uh, sailors shipwrecked along the route faced certain death. It became a viable merchant marine route due to climate change. It is a vital shipping artery between the hemispheres. Until Amudesin, no one could navigate it. So this one for me is relatively straightforward. Um, the The author here definitely said, if you can adapt, you you might survive long enough to be rescued. So it's not certain death. So I'm going to get rid of that one. Agreed. Uh, a vital shipping artery between the hemispheres. It doesn't mention anything about um, that. Uh, obviously, it is a, a merchant marine route, but vital shipping artery isn't mentioned. And then until Amundusen, Amun, Amundsen, however you say that, uh, none could navigate it again uh, isn't true because people were navigating it, but it was it was hard. Um, and so I'm going to get rid of that as well. And th right, right off the bat, the author did mention until climate change, thin the ice. Um, so climate change obviously helping it become a viable merchant marine route. Yep, absolutely. I, I agree with you. And, 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 Answer choice D, also the Inuit have been navigating it. Yeah. Right? The, the people who live there. Right? So we could definitely cross out D. Yep. All right. Uh, let's move on. So question 49, which of the following best characterizes the author's opinion regarding the men of the Franklin expedition? All right. So just remembering um, Franklin, we were given lots of names. Franklin, Scott, Emin, Eminson. So Franklin is one of the first ones that came up with the um, the 129 people that perished, becoming icebound, yeah. even though they seemed prepared with their strengthened boat. Um, yeah. So what is the author, you know, implying about Franklin? Why, you know, why 
what did what what does the author think about Franklin? Um, I don't know. Other than the author talking about this um, heavily reinforced and well provisioned, meaning they were well stocked up, so seemingly prepared, but still failed. Yeah, they were. They, why did they fail though? Um, well, because they didn't adapt. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they they failed. Because they didn't adapt. So they were ready. But, you know, when, when trouble struck, they weren't able to adapt. And that's why they failed. Yeah. So let's go into the answer choices, kind of looking for that. Okay. So answer choice A, their clothing and provisions made survival in the Canadian Arctic impossible. Um, so this one, to me, the impossible is one of those, like, really strong words. And I'm like, oh, it's never, it's never that. Uh, so it's just because of that one word, I'm like, I'm going to get rid of that one. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we know that their clothing wasn't right, right? Cotton-based clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know anything about their provisions other than that they were well-stocked with provisions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to get rid of A. Uh, answer choice B, the sense of cultural superiority that prompted them to reject Inuit ways was directly responsible for their deaths. So this one is like, ooh, that's definitely the right answer. But we don't know why they rejected the Inuit ways. We don't know that they thought they were culturally superior. They just know that yeah. they wanted to do it their way. Yeah. Um, so that that one for me is like, it's it's trying to bait you in to pick that one. But I'm not sure if that's the right answer yet. It, agreed. So answer to C, they could have lived indefinitely in the Arctic had they had adopted parts of the Inuit lifestyle. Uh, so again, that's that kind of going back to the, the author said they could have survived long enough for, um, for rescue, not necessarily live indefinitely. So that one, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out and D their decisions subsequent to the loss of their ships played a significant role in their ultimate fate. And that to me is like the, the answer, right? They, yeah. they were well prepared going in, they got stuck and then everything that they decided after that uh, led to them perishing. Yep. Absolutely. It's their inability to adapt afterwards. So good. Yeah. I agree with you. B is definitely a trap answer. I think what makes B wrong is the cultural superiority. Yeah. That makes that wrong. Yeah. Cool. Let's go on to number 50. The passage most strongly implies that the conquest of the South Pole provided the ultimate test of Inuit survival strategies because. So why was the ant, the South Pole, the ultimate test? Um, so let's just keep that. Let's keep that in mind. This is kind of, you know, could, a prediction could go in any way. Uh, Amun Desen prepare, preparation avoided the use of any Western style technologies or survival techniques. The consequences of failure in such a hostile environment proved to be fatal. The continent of Antarctica is not home to any indigenous peoples. And the explorers were motivated by the prestige that would come with reaching the pole first. <laughs> So mm. why was it the ultimate test of Inuit strategies? So I'm going to throw out D first, just because mm -hmm. obviously the, the race and prestige has nothing to do with being the ultimate test. Um, the continent of Antarctica is not home to any indigenous people. We don't necessarily know that. Or I don't think the, the passage doesn't specifically say anything. Let's... That. Let's look back into uh, the passage. Do we now? We don't want to bring in any outside information, right? Mm -hmm. What do we know about Antarctica? Let's let's be able to po provide evidence that Antarctica is not home to any indigenous people, or it is home to indigenous people. Where in the passage can we refer to for it for evidence? Um. So. This fourth paragraph here, Inuit technology is also suburbly adapted to the Arctic. Potentially, okay. maybe. Okay. Um, Let's go back to the ultimate test. To the area where the author mentions that this is the ultimate test. Yeah. Um... I don't know. So I'm looking here at this whatever one, two, three, four, fifth, fifth or sixth paragraph here. Um, 
Oh, so less less than a decade after the first human set foot on the continent. So no no indigenous people. No indigenous uh, people. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, let's let's keep that there. Let's keep moving. Okay. So B, the consequences of failure in such a hostile environment proved to be fatal. I don't know if that's the ultimate test because people were dying <laughs> for, f by not using their survival strategies for a long time before mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then answer choice A, uh, Emin uh, Eminson's preparation avoided the use of any Western style technology survival techniques. So I'm going to throw this out because we don't know that we obviously know that they adapted a lot of the Inuit quote unquote technologies, but we don't know that they didn't use any Western style technologies or survival techniques. So this one I'm going to throw out as well. So I'm only left with C. Yeah, agreed. We could throw out A because, you know, uh, Amudesin used skis and sled dogs, right? So sled dogs are possibly Inuit, but skis, I don't know, mm. I, you know, never really mentions. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, yeah, see, you know, the, it says after less than a decade after the first human set foot on the continent. So previous to a decade ago at which, you know, Amundsen started uh, on his journey to the South Pole, there weren't any humans on there before. It was untouched. Yep. So, so we can definitely pick answer choice C. Question 51, which of the following is most similar to the discussion of meat preparation in paragraph three? So, Good. uh, I, Obviously, we don't know what is most. I can't predict yet, but I re I do remember them talking about the the Westerners cooking the meat um, instead of eating it raw, which robbed it of vital nutrients. Yeah, right. So, so us going into this preparation of it actually removed the vital nutrients required for survival. Yep. Okay. So we're looking for an answer choice that kind of matches that. Yep. So A, removing the vitamin-filled germ layer from brown rice to make white rice. So I'm like, ooh, that's basically what we just said. Um, so let's see. B, conventional butcher practices of trimming excess fat from cuts of meat. Um, potentially, maybe. I mean, they, they talked about eating skin. and Is that excess fat that the other people didn't eat? I don't know. It's a little bit of a stretch. Um, C, processing coffee beans to lower the level of caffeine. Uh, I don't think that's a good comparison. Uh, D, the consumption of dairy products to maintain healthy calcium and vitamin D levels. Again, I don't think that's the same. So I'd go with the answer choice A here. Yeah, and A is correct. Yeah, the, the process of preparing it actually removes vital nutrients. You know, C, caffeine isn't a vital nutrient, right? I, yep. I've lived like the first 10 <laughs> years of my no, I was 15 years of my life without drinking any caffeine. <laughs> I, I don't drink caffeine to this day. I don't have any coffee. I've never had a cup of coffee. It's crazy. <laughs> Ryan, I admire you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's anything to admire. But, uh, I just don't like incredible. it. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't know. All right. Okay. Um, let's go on to number 52. Based on the information presented in the passage, all of the following contributed to the failure and loss of the Scott Antarctic Expedition, except. So uh, all of these caused the Scott Antarctic Expedition to fail and then cross them out. Or what wasn't mentioned or what's an accept question uh, that, that, you know, so basically find whatever caused the Scott Antarctic expedition to fail and then cross it out. Yeah. So adoption of slower modes of transportation. Was that um, mentioned? It, it wasn't. They, they said motorized vehicles and ponies. All right. Ponies obviously are slower than sled dogs, you would assume. I guess because of that, I guess that would be the answer, just comparing ponies to sled dogs. Yeah, so remember, we're picking something that de that, 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 is, that caused them to fail, and we're going to cross it out. Yeah. All right, so A, caused them to fail. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, B, failure to appreciate the nutrition content of raw meat. So they didn't talk about the food that they ate uh, specifically. They they talked about a lot of different things, but not the diets that they had that they yeah. used. They they did talk about malnutrition, 
but it, it could have been for other reasons. They, they could have consumed raw meat, but still died of malnutrition. Yeah, agreed. That could be a possibility, right? Let's go on to see inability to use the innovations of other cultures. So definitely, that was the, the big comparison. Yeah, we could cross that out. Lack of winter clothing produced from water repellent animal products. Yeah, that was specifically called out. Yeah. So answer choice B. B. Is the correct like answer. Nice. I, I like it when it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> All right, last question for this passage. Which of the following, if true, would most seriously weaken the claims made by the author regarding the ultimate fate of the Franklin Expedition? So again, Franklin Expedition was the earlier one, 129 crew members perished trying to go through this Northwest Passage. Um and this is one of those tricky questions. You got to make sure that you're answering the right question. If true, would would weaken the claims? Okay. So yeah. All right. So a interpreters who interviewed in Inuit eyewitnesses of the Franklin expedition did not properly understand the language dialect spoken by the witnesses. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that's that's a weird one, right? The the yeah. claims are made based on the the quote unquote um this true cause of death uh kind of being uh really found right this definitive evidence was this eyewitness interviews mm -hmm. um could that potentially weaken i i suppose if they're not speaking the same language then it would weaken the argument mm -hmm. that's a weird answer though so i'm gonna leave that one on the table but i don't like that answer Okay. Um, answer choice B, the levels of lead in the bodies of Franklin's crew were insufficient to affect decision making. Uh, well, we know from last week that any levels of lead. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, this one, I, I don't think we can um, we can make any conclusions that the, the author never made any conclusions that lead poisoning was why they were making these bad decisions. Uh, Agreed. So I'm going to cross that one out. And then, um, modern Inuit, answer choice C, modern Inuit make use of snowmobiles, electric generators, and manufactured clothing to survive the Arctic. Um, so I don't think that the Inuit are adapting based on modern technologies weakens the fact that, um, the technologies that they used back in the day were also sufficient to survive as well. Agreed. So I'm going to get rid of C. And then D, the first ships to make landfall at the islands where Franklin and his men were stranded uh, were not... Wait. The first ships to make landfall at the islands where Franklin and his men were stranded would not survive until 1850. Not arrive until eighteen fifty, right? Would not arrive until eighteen fifty. So, oh, uh, so <laughs> what hap what, what 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 happened to Franklin? Uh, he perished prior to his perishing. Prior to his perishing, uh, they got stranded in this Northwest Passage. Yeah, and what does the author believe? Should they have, you know, trudged on to Canada? Uh, no, they should have tried to, okay. So that whole, like, wait until they're rescued. Um, mm -hmm. so could they have survived another five years? Um, potentially. Yeah. It doesn't weaken the authors, right? No. Yeah. So answer choice A, even though I don't like it, uh, is, is going to be the, the answer here, right? If, if the quote-unquote definitive evidence is, is mm -hmm. tainted because of lack of uh, interpretation in the interpreters, then obviously that's going to weaken an argument. I like it. All right. So tricky one, that, that last one a little bit, but otherwise pretty straightforward. So I think this is the first time where going through the passage and really breaking it down in the way that we're breaking it down, which is why I like bringing on uh, different instructors and tutors is, is really helpful because the, the questions you're asking me to think about are different than I've had before. And I think it's really helping the understanding of these passages and understanding of the questions. 
Yeah, no worries. That's that's how you absolutely stay engaged, right? Like, you know, you could sit here and, and be like, ah, great, let's talk about Franklin and these people who try to go to the South Pole. Or, cool, they did this. They they messed up somewhere or they ran into adversity and let's let's find out what, how they could have survived. And like, okay, interesting. That's, you know, I could probably find myself there someday, right? What can I use to survive? Yeah. And um, really asking yourself these questions to stay engaged is, I, I believe, um, what, what's going to make you do well in the cars? I, I think the biggest pushback that we're going to get from students, I can hear them all screaming now, is I don't have time to do what you are telling me to do. I, I understand, but I have a counter objection. <laughs> <laughs> objection, <So>. your honor. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys remember learning how to type in school, right? So they brought these little keyboards for us uh, that, you know, you would learn how to touch type in school. So you wouldn't use so prior to that in school, I would finger type, right? And I got pretty quick at finger typing, but there was some level that I kind of maxed out at. There was a ceiling. Now learning learning to to you know touch type initially was a little bit slow it took time but once i got a little quicker at it and practiced more now i can type much quicker than i could have ever finger typed yeah and um that's what i believe will happen in the car section yes initially it's going to take time but as you build these habits and these are habits um as you continue building these active reading habits um you're going to uh Event, this is just going to become very, uh, it's going to become natural. You don't even have to think about it anymore. Just, you just naturally do it. And uh, this is how you actively read. Mm. All right. So there you have it. So expect a little bit of a, kind of a two steps back, but hopefully five steps forward reaction to integrating these new skills and techniques into your MCAT prep.